Friday evening, we began our lecture series on Islam in the eyes of, of Christ. And our speaker has been Wissam al Athawi. Um, he um, is from uh, Detroit, Michigan, but he hails from Baghdad, Iraq. So he was born in, in Baghdad and raised a Sunni Muslim and later became a Christian and had moved to the United States seeking asylum here. And today he, uh, he preaches for the Sunset Church of Christ in, um, I think, Dearborn, uh, uh, Michigan, and uh, spends his days um, teaching uh, Muslims about Christ and Christians about uh, Muslims. And he does it in a, a loving manner. You know, when we were doing the lectureship series, one of the concerns we had was security. And so we got hold of, of course, the police department, and they vetted that thing all the way up, I think, to the FBI. And, um, and we, we talked about threat assessment and things of that nature. And, and they said, um, after looking at Wassam and his background and so forth, and, and the um, lectures that he has ha held in universities and lectureships and encampments, uh, even on radio as well as a news broadcast on TV. Um, he is one of these men that has such a, a good spirit about how he teaches that even those who are um, who are Muslims and, and follow the tenets of Islam, they don't have a problem with him. In, in Dearborn, where he lives, it's the largest population or concentrated population of Muslims in the United States. And so we're wondering, okay, well, if we, we have him here, are we going to need to have a lots of security? And they said, no. And the reason is, is because he's really well known in Dearborn among the, uh, the Muslim population, and they know the kind of message that he, he preaches and teaches. And uh, so obviously those who are of Islam here in, in our area, in the Treasure Valley, uh, they know about him because they have friends in Dearborn. And so uh, that's why we didn't have any uh, kind of problem. So uh, he's, he just, he's a man who um, has strong convictions about his faith, but he's, he's not mean about it. And that's a plus for him. And so without me taking any more of his time, uh, with Psalm al Athawi. Sir, good morning. Good morning. I'll have to go upstairs. Would that be okay? There is a clicker here. Yeah, it's really common that every time an Iraqi guy is in the building, people have security concerns. <laughs> we have that kind of influence on people. In fact, that's why they call the very name of my home country, Iraq. <laughs> And did you know that our most favorite song in the hymn book is, There is a Bomb in Gilead? <laughs> Good. Let's get to work. <laughs> Two Thanksgivings away, I received a dear visitor of mine from Iowa. And we had the Thanksgiving dinner at the house of a couple who are friends of mine. Uh, they served in Jordan as missionaries in Jordan for two decades. They speak Arabic fluently. They are very well versed in the Arabic tribes. They stayed with the Bedouins there and they preached the gospel mainly through a tuberculosis hospital that they had there. The woman is a very good cook and with the Thanksgiving turkey she cooked some Iraqi food and we were having fun and her mom was there. Her mom was also a missionary in Ethiopia, a country that is close to the Arab world but is not an Arab country. It is an Amharic country, a country that speaks Amharic, which is not related to Arabic in any way. Arabic is a Semitic language. Amharic is a Hamitic language. Shem, Ham, sons of Noah. So as we was making this conversation, you will know it's a Thanksgiving. Even though it's a, a, a family of believers, you would expect uh, forks and knives to be flying at a certain point. I asked that woman, the mother who served in Ethiopia, what name did you use for God there? I know they don't speak Arabic, but Ethiopia is geographically close to the Arab world. Did you use the name Allah? She said, oh no. I said, ma'am, you know that this is the name that Arabs use for God. She said, I would never use that. The Holy Spirit told me that to use that. Wow. Instead of answering her, I was inspired to write the class that I will be sharing with you this morning a critically acclaimed, pew-busting, smash-hit, controversial class that is... Now, yesterday we studied the theology of Islam, the religion of Islam, and today this class will conclude the theology of Islam. We will talk about the very object of, of the Islamic worship, the Quranic God known as Allah. 
And because the name Allah is infamously known in the Western world as part of that war cry, Allahu Akbar, that a suicide bomber would yell before he blows himself up, Allah has been a matter of controversy. So many stories and, and, and posts and Facebook memes have we seen on the social media recently that they cannot all be true at the same time. Some people said that Allah is Satan. Some said that he's the moon or the moon god. Or that he's an idol that Arabs used to worship. Or that he's actually another being that exists in parallel with the God of the Bible that tells people to, to, to kill and to murder and to blow themselves up. I think if you want to be involved in any way, in any kind of outreach to Arabs and to Muslims, you will have to learn the full answer to the question, is Allah God? Because that can be a stumbling block. There are three parts. Once again, I'm a preacher. There are three parts to the answer to this question, and you have to know the full answer. There is a yes and there is a no. There is a linguist, linguistic part. There is an anthropological part. We'll study that in a minute. And there is a theological part. The first part of the answer is the linguistic part. Yes, the word Allah is actually Arabic for God. Arabs used the, name, the word Allah talking about God for thousands of years before English was even born. God has different names in different languages. This may be a, a, a shock to some of you, but actually not everybody in the world speaks English. Now, English is the most common language in the world by, na by, by, by country, not by native speakers. You know what's the most common language by native speakers? Chinese. Every four people in the world, there is one that speaks Chinese, but it is not the most spoken country, uh, language in the world by country. Only three countries speak Chinese. The most common language in the world by country is English, and it uses the name God for God, but that does not mean that God has a driver's license with name God. That is just the English word for God. The French use another name for God, Dieu. Dieu is not different than God. He is not another God. He is the same God. That's the way the French call God. It is ridiculous to say that the third most spoken language by country and the oldest in this list has a word for everything except God. That is actually the only recorded word that Arabs used before Islam and during Islam for God. Can you tell what words any language or any people or any culture used for any specific time, for example, would you be able to tell what kind of word did Arabs use for God 2,000 years ago? There is an easy solution. You make a time machine and you travel to the past and you ask an Arab person there, right? Or, or you can read the literature from the Arab world from that time which still exists today and see what word did they use for God. By the way, this is not the only uh, thing. Yeah, uh, Arabic has this uh, uh, word for God. Arabic is not unrelated to the rest of the languages, specifically Hebrew, its sister language, which is the language of the Old Testament of the Bible. Yesterday we saw this class and we learned that the, uh, uh, the God is, the, the, the Arabic Bibles, all the Arabic translations of the Bible use the word Allah for God. By the way, we are talking about the language, the meaning of the word Allah. We are not talking about the Quranic God yet. When the word Allah is used in the non-Arab speaking world, like the United States, they usually talk about the Quranic God as opposed to the biblical God. We are not there yet. We are still in the linguistic part because I'm an Arab. And when I pray, when I have my personal devotional with God, when I pray, when I read my scripture, I actually speak in Arabic. And I call God Allah. Because that's the word that I was born and raised, the only word in Arabic that exists for God. By the way, literally, the Arabic Bible says in John 3.16, لِأَنَّهُ هَكَذَا أَحَبْ اللَّهِ الْعَالَمْ حَتَّى بَذَلَ إِبْنَهُ الْوَحِيدِ لِكَيْ لَا يَهْلُكْ كُلْ مَنْ يُؤْمُنْ بِهِ بَلْ تَكُونُ لَهُ الْحَيَاةِ الْأَبَدِيَةِ Literally, for Allah so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Like we said, Arabic is a sister language 
to Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament. 80%, over 80% of words in Arabic and Hebrew are similar to each other, including the Hebrew word for God. Usually, the Bible uses the plural form, and in most cases, the Bible, the, the Old Testament uses the plural form for Allah or for God, Elohim. Some parts of the Bible, like this verse that you can see here, by the way, if you don't have a, an interlinear Bible, this is my favorite website, biblehub.com. You can go there and you can have as many translations as you want and you can have the original Bible texts in Hebrew for the Old Testament and in Greek for the New Testament. And it actually uses the Hebrew word Eloh for God. That's what the Bible uses. Sounds an awful lot like the word Allah. Arabs were among the first people who heard the gospel. We read about that where? Which part of the Bible that talks about the beginning of the Christian age? Acts 2. The first sermon in the Christian age. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles of Jesus Christ, 12, not 120, and they started doing a certain miracle. What was that miracle? Speaking in languages that they have never been exposed to. They were not educated people. They were fishermen. They never left Galilee pretty much in all their lives, and yet they started to speak in at least 16 languages. People were amazed when they saw those uneducated Galilean fishermen talking in tongues. They said in Acts 2 verse 7, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in our own languages, our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, blah, 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 blah. We usually skip this part and miss verse 11 that says Cretans and Arabs. Yes, sir. Arabs were among the first people who heard the gospel. They are believers. They were in Jerusalem for the Passover and the Pentecost. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So unlike what that woman said in the Thanksgiving, the Holy Spirit actually used the Arabic word for God. There is only one recorded Arabic word for God, and that is Allah. The Arabic Bibles, like we said, use all of them, use the word Allah for God. If you have seen the passion of Christ, when Jesus Christ, a.k.a. Jim Caviezel, was nailed to the cross, he screamed, Elohi, Elohi, lima shabaktani. Literally, my Allah, my Allah, why have you forsaken me? That's the linguistic part. Second, the anthropological part. Anthropology is a fancy word that studies people apart from God. The word that studies cultures of people. We are not talking about God yet. Yesterday, we have learned that Islam, though it claims to be from God, was not from God. How can you tell that Islam is not from God? Three proofs. Does not have fulfilled prophecies. Muhammad did not do any miracle in public. And his message was not consistent with the rest of the revelations that he acknowledged, like the Bible. Well, so Muslims or Muhammad did not receive the message of Islam from God. Whether he made it up, whether he really saw a vision, we, we cannot tell. No one can really tell. But anthropologically, when you talk about humans alone, Islam actually imported the Quranic God, Allah as the Quranic God, is imported from the biblical God. Muslims do not worship the moon any more than the Jews worship stars. Yes, Muslims use the moon as their symbol because they follow the lunar calendar. They observe the moon to see when Ramadan starts, when Ramadan ends, when the Hijri year starts, etc., etc. But that is the symbol of Muslims. Let's see. Let's take a look at the Quran and see what the Quran says about the Quranic God, Allah. The Quran says that Muslims should worship the biblical God. The Quran says in chapter 4 and verse 163, 
surely we have revealed to you that is Muhammad as we have revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob. The Quran says that you should worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That sounds like God to me. The Quran also says that the Christians and the Jews are worshiping the same God that the Muslims worship. This is in chapter 5 and verse 69 of the Quran. Surely those who believe, that's the Muslims, and those who are Jews and the Sabians and the Christians, whoever believes in Allah. Now, yesterday we studied an Islam mythbuster that eventually Islam introduced itself as the only way to God, does not recognize the other Abrahamic religions anymore. This part says that Muslims and Jews and Christians, they all go to heaven. That was abrogated. That was superseded by a later passage that said, surely the only recognized religion in the sight of God is Islam. But I am quoting this passage to say that the Quran says that the Quranic God is the same as the biblical God. Whether this claim is accurate or not, that's for the third part of the answer. The third verse says that both Muslims and Christians are worshiping the same God. Say to the people of the book, that's the Bible, our God and your God is one, and to him we submit ourselves. If you take a look at the Quran, you would see that the Quranic God is the creator. He created the heaven and the earth in six days. He created Adam and Eve. He was the main character in the story of Adam and Eve. He was the one who brought the flood of Noah and told Noah to build the ark. This is all in the Quran. He actually was the one who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. So he's the Jehovah of the Bible. That's the Arabic word. Arabic is not a sacrilegious language. It's just a language. And he is the, the, the creator and the sovereign and the king and all. The third part of the answer to this question is the theological part. Does the Quranic God match the biblical God religiously, spiritually, theologically? The answer is no. Even though the Quran says that Muslims and Christians are worshiping the same God, the Quran failed to describe God, did not create a new God, but failed to describe the one and only God. And by the way, Muslims are not the only people who are having this problem, as we studied before and as we will come to in a minute. The main theological difference between the biblical God and the Quranic God, known in America as Allah, is that the Quranic God does not have a son. A Muslim would tell you, well, I believe in the same God that you believe in, but I don't believe that Jesus is his son. Well, this is a very serious issue. You cannot believe in God without believing in his son. Because John said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 23. 1 John 2, 23. Whoever denies the son does not have the father either. He who acknowledges the son has the father also. And so you cannot say, well, I worship God, I believe in God, but I choose to not believe that he has a son. You cannot pick and choose that. John said, you either believe in God and his son in a package, or you, you are not talking about that God. You are being misled about that God. You, you are misinformed and you are confused about God. The second passage of the Quran, by the way, the Quran says in Surah 112 and verses 2 and 3 that God has neither begotten anyone nor was he begotten. The second passage tells us in chapter 2 and verse 31, another difference between God and the, the, the biblical God and the Quranic God. The Quranic God is more controlling and stronger than the biblical God. The biblical God has some emotions, has uh, times when he regrets things, and that can be a stumbling block to the Muslim people. They are used to God that is 
bigger and almighty, more almighty than the biblical God. Which, by the way, you cannot... Now, you know that God is infinitely powerful. He is the all-powerful... Uh, what's the omni word for? Or omnipotent, yes. So not omnipotent. <laughs> God is the omnipotent part. But how big and how strong do you want God to be? And one of the most philosophical arguments in the Muslim world is, can God create a rock that's bigger than him? If you say yes, then he's not all powerful because the rock would be stronger than, than him. If you say no, then he's not all powerful because he could not do something. And so you cannot go all the way to describe God as a controlling God. God has given us the freedom of choice. And in one example in the Bible, God said that Adam was the one who chose names for stuff. Adam was the one who, which makes sense. The Quran says that, no, God taught Adam all names. It does not make any sense. Did God t teach Adam all names of everything that was ever invented in every language? That does not make any sense. But this is what the Quran says about God. It says that the Quran is so controlling, he did not have Adam choose to call things by name. The third passage says that God is not love. God only loves good people, good guys, not the bad guys. The Bible tells us that God loved us so much that Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. Whether you wanted to respond to the gospel or not, God has already paid the punishment for your sin. Whether you want to accept that free gift or not, that's your option. Not the Quranic God. The Quranic God says that he does not love the disbelievers. The fourth passage says that unlike the biblical God, whose will is for all to be saved, for all to come to the knowledge of the truth, for all to come to repentance, the Quranic God does not want everybody to be saved. In fact, he said that I want to fill hell first before I talk about the salvation of people. And fortunately, some people in the Christian world believe in false doctrines that God has chosen already whom to be saved and whom to be lost. I hate that doctrine. Not only because it's false, but because I had a personal encounter with it. In a few minutes, you will be hearing my convergence story and how I went for a time of 12 years to every single church building in Baghdad trying to get baptized in vain. You are an Arab. You are not supposed to be a Christian. Okay, why are you a Christian and I'm not? Because God chose me and did not choose you. There is one thing in common among all those people who preach the Calvinistic doctrine, the spiritual racism. One thing in common among all of them, they think that they are chosen. Right? Well, God says that his will is not for everybody to be saved. In fact, his will is for hell, hell, hell to be filled first. The Fifth passage, we studied this yesterday in Islam Mythbuster. This is the Quranic version of the Great Commission. You know what the Bible says about the Great Commission? Take the gospel, share the gospel with all people, make disciples. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. The Quran also tells Muslims to spread Islam by force. Fight them until fitna or persecution is no more and religion is all for Allah. By the way, not only theologically the Bible is peace and the Quran is violence, but also historically. Within a few decades, the Christian faith covered the whole Mediterranean world. Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me from Jerusalem starting with Acts 2, to Judea and Samaria, starting at Acts 8, and to the end of the world, starting at Acts 13. Do you know where the end of the world is? The Strait of Gibraltar, between Spain and Morocco. Believed by the world back then to be the end of the world, there is nothing there because America was not discovered yet. 
And within the lifetime of the apostles, the Christian faith reached all the way to the end of the Mediterranean world, to the Strait of Gibraltar, the, 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 between uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean world. Likewise, within a few decades after the death of Muhammad, the Islamic faith also covered, especially the southern part of the Mediterranean world, by force. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, a companion of Muhammad and the leader of the Islamic army, conquered Iraq four years after Muhammad's death. By the way, I am not a native Iraqi. I am an Arab. It was my own forefathers that took over Iraq from its native Babylonians. I have only been in Iraq for 1,400 years. Khalid ibn al-Walid conquered Syria and uh, Jerusalem. Amr ibn al-As conquered Egypt a few years after the death of Muhammad. They all sat at the feet of Muhammad. And so that's another difference, theological difference between the God of the... Oh, this is my car keys. No. Okay. <laughs> Long story short, is Allah God? Well, linguistically, yes, he is God. He is the, 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 the Arabic word for God. Allah is the Arabic word for God. And the Quranic God actually says that, that he's the same as the biblical God. But theologically, no, because the Quran fails to describe the Quranic God. Now, why is it important to know the full answer? It is important to know the linguistic part so that you do not talk with an Arab Christian and tell him that he is worshipping a different God. This man was involved in a mission that distributed Bibles in Indonesia. And he was supported by a church in Texas. And the church invited him. They said, what word did you, did you use for God in this, this translation of the Bible? He said, Allah. They discontinued his support and terminated his ministry. That's how much of a stumbling block... This ethnocentricity, this ignorance in the people's cultures and languages can be. You have to know the anthropological part. You wouldn't tell a Muslim to stop worshipping God and start worshipping a different God. No, you redefine God to him or her. You teach him the more accurate truth about God. Yes, John said that he who does not have the Son does not have the Father. However, Paul said about his fellow countrymen, the Jews who did not believe in Jesus, who did not have the Son, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but zeal that is not according to knowledge. And no, so that you do not say that we and Muslims are in fellowship with each other, worshiping the same God. Especially when the Bible says that the only way to God is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that in uh, multiple places. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Peter said in Acts 4, 12, that there is no salvation in any other than Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Is Allah a different being than God? No, he is not. Well, he is, but he is not. Sounds confusing? Paul gives us another confusing description of the gospel that gave birth to Islam, the perverted gospel of the Judaizers. And Paul talked about that false gospel in Galatians 1. We studied yesterday the Judaizers who came and said, unless you are circumcised according to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. And Paul doesn't know anything about the gospel. Listen to us. Paul said in Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of God to a different gospel. How many Gospels do we have according to this verse? Two. The true Gospel that Paul preached and the different Gospel that the Judaizers preached. Then he says in the very next verse, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the Gospel of Christ. 
How many gospels do we have according to this verse? One. He said, well, it's not really a different gospel. It's just a perversion of the one and only gospel. And this is the exact same and parallel answer to the question, is Allah God? Well, yes and no. I hope I have left you more confused than before this class started. I will be seeing you in a few minutes. A 15-minute break, 20-minute break, and then we'll all be back in here for uh, our assembly time. So just visit with one another or do something. <laughs>